Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Criminal Appeal Lawyers Association webinar on recent cases of interest from the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. I'm David Emmanuel QC uh, from Garden Court Chambers, and my colleague Farat Arshad from Doughty Street is the other presenter today. And uh, we hope you enjoy this uh, trip through the last 12 months or so of the Court of Appeal cases. We're going to cover cases which we hope are useful to the practitioner and cover a wide and diverse area of subjects such as discounts for guilty pleas, life sentences in sex cases, and not falling asleep in court. Anyway, without further ado, and we're going to do six cases each, and we'll take them two at a time. Barat drew the longest straw, so she goes first. Um, so without further ado, over to you. Thanks, David. You'll have to forgive uh, both of us. There's going to be an element of faffing, which we're going to try and minimise. But um, as you can see from our youth, we're excellent at technology. Um, but let's see how we go. So um, I'm going to start with the case of picture, which hopefully has now come up on your screens. And David will tell me uh, if it hasn't. And um, there's PowerPoints in respect uh, of a few of these. Just before I start, um, those of you who work in uh, appeals will know that there are, there are very many decisions produced each month, never mind over the last year. So it's been very difficult for David and I to select cases. We obviously can't cover everything uh, in the time we've got. But what we've tried to do is bring to your attention cases that are of interest, but particularly that you can use in practice or will need to use and know about in practice. Um, I'll start with a case of um, picture, as I say, because this is a very recent decision, as you can see, um, the case reference is there in the date of judgment. Uh, and one thing I like to do is pull out um, who the court was, the constitution of the court, because Certainly, I uh, find it quite interesting to see um, what the who the people making the decisions are and therefore what the decision is as well. You'll see that the date of the judgment of picture is 8th of July uh, of this year. It was uh, an appeal against conviction, uh, uh, murder conviction. And uh, in the case, the defendant was blaming W, who was a prosecution witness, his lodger for the murder. Uh, and I should mention this uh, appeal was brought by my colleague, uh, Tim Maloney QC from Dirty Street Chambers. Now, in the case, both the defendant and W told a number of lies. Um, w, as I say, was called as a prosecution witness and he was cross-examined as to the lies he told. And these are lies told at a, a fairly early stage of the investigation, soon after the body was found, etc. When he was cross-examined, he admitted to telling lies, um, but he couldn't say why he had lied. He didn't offer an explanation for the lies. Now, uh, as is normal, a Lucas direction was given in respect of the defendant, but due to the specific um, fact in the case, which was that D was seeking to blame W for the murder, D sought to use W's lies um, uh, as an admission of guilt or, or to say to the jury, because he's lying, he's guilty of the murder. And because of that, the trial judge decided that there had to be a lies direction given in respect uh, of W, as well as a Lucas direction given in respect of the defendant. D argued at appeal that to give a lies direction in respect of W's evidence was wrong for two reasons. First of all, it, it impermissibly drew an equivalence between the prosecution witness and the defendant. And secondly, it was inviting the jury to speculate as to possible reasons why W might have lied when he hadn't provided any explanation in his evidence. The appeal was dismissed uh, and the court held that uh, Lucas direction, everybody knew the well-established parameters of when a Lucas direction uh, would be given. And it was given in those circumstances, as we all know, where there's a danger that the jury might regard the conclusion uh, that D told lies as probative of his guilt of the offence which they're considering, uh, and therefore Lucas directions are given to avoid the risk of forbidden reasoning. And as the Court of Appeal said, which you'll see at the bottom uh, of this particular slide, the present appeal poses the question why a similar process of reasoning should not be required in the case of a non-defendant witness whose admitted lies are relied upon by the defence as demonstrating that it is in fact the witness who is guilty of the crime for which the defendant is on trial. So that's what the judge was trying to uh, guard against. 
The court agreed with the appellant that it was inapposite to give a Lucas direction in respect of a witness, um, but a tailored direction should be given if it will assist the jury, uh, the court making the point that as far as possible in each case, in each trial, there should be tailored directions because the whole point of directions was to assist the jury. Such a direction should be issue relevant and must not put the burden on D. So, for example, as you would have in a normal Lucas direction, uh, what you shouldn't have in, in a prosecution witness lies direction uh, was a direction the jury must be sure that W's lies were not told for an innocent reason. That shouldn't be given and it wasn't given in this particular case. The court did say that it was arguable that in the particular case, the direction gave false equivalence between the way in which the jury was to approach the lies told by D and the lies told by W. But the CACD was confident that no substantial misdirection uh, arose in the particular circumstances uh, of that case. Um, so it's worth having a look at, if only to see what sort of lies direction would be given uh, in respect of a prosecution witness. But it is important that it's not the same uh, as a full Lucas direction uh, that's given in respect of a defendant. So that's the case of Pitcher. The next case I want to talk about is uh, the case of uh, Aaron Mark McWilliams. Uh, and you'll see that this is a fairly recent decision as well. Uh, it was an attorney general's reference. Uh, and it uh, was the judgment is the 21st of May, as you can see. The court made the point at the outset that this was the third occasion in a matter of months in which the Attorney General had sought leave to refer a sentence uh, to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division arising from the interrelationship between Section 82A3 of the Powers of Criminal Court Sentencing Act 2000. And that, of course, is the court's power to fix the minimum term to be served under a discretionary life sentence and the custodial period after which prisoners serving determinate sentences are eligible for release as set out in the Criminal Justice Act 2003. Because as you all know, there's been recent statutory instruments uh, uh, changing what uh, the, the uh, or at which point uh, an offender is entitled to release, how much of their sentence they have to serve in custody. And the court here was interested in the interrelation between that and setting a minimum term in discretionary life sentence cases. Now, um, the facts of this case are particularly grueling. I mean, we're all used to, to a, a certain level of, of horror in what we do, but these were particularly bleak, it has to be said. Um, the defendant had pleaded guilty to 40 child sex offences committed over a four and a half year period with 23 child victims. And it perhaps was unsurprising that the sentencing judge imposed a discretionary life sentence. He calculated it as follows. The notional determinate sentence would have been 27 years imprisonment. He would give credit for the offender's early guilty pleas, and that would therefore reduce that by one third to 18 years imprisonment. And then this is where the trouble began, because um, what the judge then did is say that the minimum term would be set at half of the notional determinate term, that is nine years imprisonment. Now, at the time, immediately after the judge uh, gave the sentence, the prosecution counsel raised the point whether, in fact, because the early release um, provisions for sexual and violent offences had come into force, whether, in fact, it should be uh, a two thirds, um, the minimum term should be two thirds of the notional determinant term. And the judge said, well, if you want to bring it back under the slip rule, we'll go ahead. Uh, and she did. Um, but at that further hearing, the judge said that he couldn't see anything that told him he must apply two thirds rather than a half. And so off the AG trotted um, to the Court of Appeal. There were three grounds upon which the uh, Attorney General argued that the sentence um, was unduly lenient. But the, the primary ground was um, this one, that the effect of the release of prisoners alteration of relevant proportion of sentence order 2020 number 158 was that the minimum term should have been calculated by taking two thirds of the notional determinate term. And just a word on uh, that order, 2020 number 158, for those of you who are, aren't aware of it, certain sexual and violent offences, if they come within um, the schedule, uh, and they're seven years or more, um, the offender has to serve uh, two thirds uh, of that sentence rather than uh, as it used to be half for a determinate term. Uh, 
So the AG argued, well, if in those cases you have to serve um, two thirds, why then do you not have to serve two thirds of the discretionary life sentence? On the other hand, uh, the defendant, the offender, argued that Parliament could not have intended that the minimum term for discretionary life sentences for offences subject to the terrorist offenders restriction of early release act 2020 should be calculated taking one half of the notion determinate term, whereas the minimum terms for relevant violent and sexual offences should be calculated as two thirds of the notional determinate term. Now, the reason that was argued was you, you'll see the case referred to in, in the middle of uh, the slide there, Sheikh and Abdullah, which again, two colleagues of mine, Ben Newton and Richard Thomas from Chambers, argued it was there held um, that whereas the act was concerned, um, it was still half that was to be uh, applied to any discretionary sentence. You'll see that in this case, in Williams, um, the court came to a different conclusion when dealing with the uh, early release provisions for sexual and violent offences. The court agreed that any measure which increases minimum terms in life sentences by one third is a matter uh, for parliament. Uh, and that was quoting the case of Barinskas. Um, and uh, quoting Sheikh and Abdullah, the court again agreed that parliament's intention to effect such a significant change had to be manifest with sufficient clarity. And of course, the Attorney General in this case was relying uh, on the statutory instrument that increased the custodial term for sexual and violent offences and said it's that statutory instrument. So Parliament did do it. They just did it through the statutory instrument. And the court agreed. The court said, although it would have been possible to communicate that change in a clearer and more coherent way than achieved by the 2020 order, nonetheless, the order did sufficiently manifest such an intention. Uh, and in the court's view, uh, their view was supported by obiter dicta in certain cases, Khan, uh, McCann and Sinaga uh, and Sheikh and Abdullah itself. Uh, obiter, because when those cases were discussing um, the principle, um, the early release provisions weren't in force. But the court said um, it's clear from the dicta there. Uh, that if such an order were in force, then it would change the minimum term to be applied uh, in those relevant offence discretionary life sentences. The court justified the difference um, in the approach to be adopted when calculating minimum terms for discretionary life sentences for offences which are subject to the 2020 Act, which is the terrorism offences, and those which are subject to the 2020 order, uh, on the other hand, relevant sexual and violent offences, by saying, well, it's the inevitable result of the different language used in the relevant legislation from which Parliament's intention was principally to be derived. And you'll see in the judgment what the court says is you have to look at the individual uh, statutory instrument or act that you're concerned with to see what the repercussions of it are. And if we look at the early release um, order, it is clear um, that when you apply Section 82 to it, you've got to take it into account. Um, the court went on to say that while Serber and McCann described taking one half of the notional determinate sentence as the normal approach in discretionary life sentence cases, um, that was because when the sentences in those cases were passed, the only early release provisions, uh, provisions in Section 2441 uh, which could be taken into account, provided for the release of prisoners serving determinate sentences at the halfway point. And of course, that position had now changed. Section 244 now provided for a different early release provision for relevant violent and sexual offences. And judges fixing minimum terms for such offences were obliged to take that provision into account. Because if you look at Section 82, Subsection 3, that's what it says. Um, and so, therefore, for such offences, two thirds was now. Uh, the normal proportion uh, to be taken uh, into account. Um, so that's the case of McWilliams. It's a bit of a quick trot through, um, but I hope that that was helpful. Um, David, over to you. Thanks very much, Farhat. Well, I'm going to start um, my six cases with a topic that has um, surely affected every single one of you who is a practitioner out there over the last year or so because I'm going to begin with the effect of COVID on sentence. Uh, and uh, don't worry, it's not just Manning, which um, surely you all know about. But let's start with Manning because um, that's where it all begins. 
So the case of Manning uh, in April 2020, so right at the beginning of the pandemic with the Lord Chief Justice at the helm. And what the case did was it recognised the effects of COVID on prisoners and the relevance that has for sentence. And what were the effects and what are the effects still after all this time were well, the lack of face-to-face -face visits, the longer periods stuck in the cell, and the anxiety about catching COVID, and as the court recognised, not just for the prisoner, but for the prisoner's family too. So a very different and harsher prison experience than had ever been before. And it's important to bear in mind the words of the Lord Chief Justice, which no doubt many of you have uh, used yourselves on many occasions. Judges and magistrates can therefore, and in our judgment, should keep in mind that the impact of a custodial sentence is likely to be heavier during the current emergency than it would otherwise be. Applying ordinary principles where a court is satisfied that a custodial sentence must be imposed, the likely impact of that sentence continues to be relevant to the further decisions as to its necessary length and whether it can be suspended. So Manning's obviously the most important case. It's the Lord Chief Justice sending another message on sentencing, um, a number of which I've covered in previous webinars before. And not only does it still remain relevant today, uh, it, the fact is this, it's obviously important to short sentences where even a modest reduction can make a big difference to the time that's going to be served as a percentage of the sentence. But what I want to look at following on from Manning are two other issues. What about long sentences? Does this still have effect? And what about appealing a sentence that was passed before the pandemic, two issues that have arisen in the Court of Appeal in the last year. So, we turn to the case of Whittington, a November 2020 case with Green LJ uh, presiding. And what um, the court said in Whittington, this was an eight year sentence, and it was passed well before the pandemic, many, many months before. And in fact, there was an application for leave to appeal sentence 14 months out of time. And the argument was, well, I know I had the sentence passed before the pandemic, but I'm still suffering from the harsh conditions. So can you please reduce my sentence accordingly, relying on Manning? Well, that didn't go down terribly well. Uh, what the court said as regards pre-pandemic sentences is this, it will rarely, if ever, be appropriate to reduce a long sentence passed many months before the pandemic started. Lengthy applications for extension of time like this are likely to be given short shrift. So don't bother, you're going nowhere if you're that far out of time. Manning applies to sentences at the time they're passed and whether the sentence passed at that time can be said to be wrong in principle or manifestly excessive. But what about longer sentences generally? Well, the longer the sentence, the less the effect of the pandemic can weigh in the balance in favour of a reduction, said the court. Over the course of a long sentence, the period of time during which the prisoner is subject to lockdown because of the pandemic might be quite short in relative terms. Well, that's presumably on the assumption that this won't go on for eight years. But importantly, and this is what I take from the case of Whittington when it comes to long sentences, the door was not shut completely on COVID being relevant to length of sentence, even if it's a long sentence to be passed. And this is important. And it's the quote that I've put on the PowerPoint. We think it likely that particularly cogent evidence of the increased harsh impact of imprisonment because of the pandemic will be needed in the case of a long-term prisoner. So take home point from that is that the court was not saying it's not relevant to longer prison sentences. It's just that there needs to be particularly cogent evidence of the increased harsh impact of imprisonment because of the pandemic. I'm not entirely sure what that means. If you're on a 23 and a half hour bang up, 
and you're likely to be that way for some considerable time, um, and you can provide perhaps evidence of it and of the fact that you're not having visits, then isn't that particularly cogent evidence of the increased harsh impact? I would say it is. But the point is this, the door is not shut just because you're not dealing with a short sentence. And this point was looked at again in the case of Darren Dixon uh, in May 2021. And this was a case with Thurwell LG, LJ presiding. Now, Dixon had a sentence passed in December 2020 of nine, what well, the judge thought nine and a half years was appropriate, uh, but reduced it to serious firearms offences. But the judge reduced the sentence to eight years to take account of the effect of COVID. So a year and a half knocked off for COVID in a long sentence. Well, this was um, referenced. What the, what the judge said was this, to reflect the increased onerousness of a prison sentence in the COVID-19 pandemic. So great result, well done, Defence Counsel. Um, the sentence was AG referenced. The court agreed that the judge was right to make a reduction identifying, as you can see in front of you, two important factors. The first was the delay in sentence because it had taken months because of the pandemic to get a sentence date. So the fact that it took a long time to come to sentence was considered relevant. Contrary to the Solicitor General's submissions, the court said, we do not accept that the long wait for sentence caused by the pandemic is of no relevance to sentence as was submitted by the Solicitor General. But perhaps more importantly, was the second factor that weighed into the balance. What is of greater significance is the effect of the pandemic prison conditions on his sentence so far. We've set out above the conditions in Wandsworth Prison. They would be wholly unacceptable in normal times. The court's focus in Manning was on much shorter sentences than those we are considering here. As a proportion of a much longer sentence, 12 months of living in COVID conditions is less than it would be of a shorter sentence. But it doesn't follow that the impact of COVID conditions should be ignored. So anyone who seeks to say Manning and its principles don't apply to long sentences needs to look at the detail of these two cases, Whittington and also of Dixon. Now, the court went on to say, and it's right to mention this, that they thought 18 months was too great a discount and they replaced it with a six month discount, but a discount all the same in a long prison sentence and worth certainly having up your sleeve the next time you're faced with a long sentence, but COVID is still biting hard. Well, that's the first of my six topics and the longest. The second is identification by police officers from CCTV. And it's the case of Liban Yaya, which is the 2020 case. Now, as you will all know, the PACE codes of conduct deal with situations where police officers, and it's becoming more and more common, as you will all know, sit at a desk in front of a computer and watch the CCTV and say, oh, I recognise that person from the beat that I used to cover. And the codes make it clear, and it's the section that I've put there, recognition by controlled showing of films, photographs and images, and it's codes D334 to 37. The codes make it clear that safeguards must still be put in place to ensure that a fair and safe procedure exists. Now, before I look at Yaya in any detail, let me just go back in time, way back to 2009 and the case of Dean Martin Smith. The codes, in fact, were not in existence back in 2009, and they largely came about as a result of cases like Smith and Moses LJ's judgment in Smith. The court explained that just like a street identification or an ID parade, there was still a need for safeguards. Moses stated, a police officer asked to view a CCTV is not in the same shoes as a witness asked to identify someone he has seen committing a crime. But as the prosecution accepted, safeguards which the code is designed to put in place are equally important in cases where a police officer is asked to see whether he can recognize anyone in a recording. The reason why 
The mischief is that a police officer may merely assert that he recognised someone without any objective means of testing the accuracy of such an assertion. And so the court went on to say the sorts of things that needed to happen and which have now been incorporated in the code. For instance, contemporaneous recording of when the officer made the identification, what he or she said at the time, why they say they were able to recognise the suspect, how they reacted, what they were told beforehand. And there are strict rules about all of this that, that are in place. All, as I say, in the codes. What Martin, uh, Dean Martin Smith went on to say was that absent any such record, it will not be possible to assess the reliability of the recognition. Only by such means can there be any assurance that the officer is not merely asserting that which he wishes and hopes, however subconsciously, to achieve, namely the recognition of a guilty participant. So, for years, Smith was a strong tool in the armory of any defence counsel or advocate, seeking to exclude a police recognition where there hadn't been a proper set of record keeping showing all the factors that would allow the jury to assess whether that recognition could be wrong. But along came Liban Yayeri's case. Now, there were fairly major breaches of the code in this case, yet the Court of Appeal didn't quash the conviction and uh, the rather flawed identification was allowed to stand. So this is a case that everyone needs to bear in mind. Although the Court of Appeal continued to emphasize the importance of compliance with the codes, and in particular, the need for contemporary note-taking by the officer watching the footage, they made it clear that a breach of the codes would not always necessarily mean exclusion of the evidence. Well, that's perhaps nothing new. Much would depend on the circumstances of the case. Now, some might say that this case waters down the compulsory nature of compliance with the code, and they might perhaps rely on the quote that I've put on the slide there. If a, so that even where there have been breaches of the code, if a detailed explanation is given of the basis for the recognition, said the Court of Appeal, particularly when the jury is in a position to view the relevant material itself, it may, depending always on other factors, be fair to admit the recognition evidence. So this decision is perhaps a creeping towards allowing flaws in police officer identifications to remain admissible. However, as usual, in cases where there are breaches, it really will come down to the nature and significance of those breaches. One must never forget the mischief, as Smith said. It's all about the jury's ability to assess the officer's assertion that he or she is right. And frankly, in the absence of proper recording of why at the time the officer says they can make that identification, I would suggest it will always be difficult for a jury to be sure that they can properly assess. And there will still be, notwithstanding yeah, yeah, a strong argument for exclusion, but we'll have to see. Right, well, that's my first two. Over to you. Thanks, David. So I'll just uh, share screen again, bear with me. So you should uh, see a slide, which is um, the crown against AB. Please shout at me if you don't see that slide, um, David, primarily, because I can't hear the rest of you. Um, so the next case I want to talk about it is um, R and AB, uh, judgment 14th of May 2021. And you see the constitution of the court there. This was an appeal against sentence. It's a guidance case. Uh, it's important. It concerns retrials and the meaning of greater severity uh, in the context of sentence after retrial. This, of course, will be a phrase that's um, familiar uh, to all of you in terms of um, something that if you're successful uh, on an appeal, but of course, is going to be a retrial. What is the sentence? And we're used to saying to clients if we're in the happy position uh, of having won an appeal against conviction, well, don't worry if there's to be a retrial, it, it, your sentence won't be any longer um, than it was before. 
In this particular case, uh, in AB's case, he'd been convicted of historic sexual offences against both his wife uh, and his sister. And uh, at the original trial following his conviction, he'd been sentenced to consecutive sentences in respect of each complainant. Um, but the judge had regard, uh, as uh, was necessary, uh, to totality. And so he'd been sentenced to seven years in respect of the offences against his wife and seven years in respect of the offences against his sister, total sentence of 14 years imprisonment. Subsequently, uh, he was successful in his appeal against both sets of allegations, appeal against conviction, and a retrial was ordered. At the retrial, for reasons that aren't gone into, into the judgment, in the judgment uh, uh, of the Court of Appeal, the prosecution offered no evidence in relation to the offences concerning his wife, CB. He was subsequently convicted of all but one of the offences against his sister. Um, at the time of his offending against his sister, BM, she had been aged between 10 and 15, and he had been aged between 15 and 20, which of course is relevant uh, to the sentence he's eventually going to get. Following the retrial in respect of his sister and his conviction, he was sentenced to seven years and nine months imprisonment. A uh, single ground of appeal was that sentence of seven years and nine months imprisonment was unlawful since it was of greater severity than the seven year sentence passed at the original trial for the same offending. It's worth mentioning it's not just the fact that it's nine months over. There was an additional count. I think it was count three, which um, he wasn't convicted of. So the, not only is it nine months more, but there was one count less. And so it was taking both of those factors into account um, that it was argued this was of greater severity. Specifically, of course, that phrase greater severity uh, is set out in paragraph 2.1 of Schedule 2 to the Criminal Appeal Act 68. And you see it there uh, on the slide where a person ordered to be retried is again convicted on retrial. The court before which he is convicted may pass in respect of the offence any sentence authorised by law not being a sentence of greater severity than that passed on the original conviction. And the fact that that phrase greater severity is used as opposed to longer will become relevant uh, and is important in the view of uh, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. The appeal was refused. Um, the court said that there was an important analogy between the phrase used in para 2.1 of Schedule 2, greater severity, um, and the phrase used in, in Section 11.3 of the Criminal Appeal Act, where the Court of Appeal upon appeal uh, against sentence is going to give their own sentence. And they're not allowed, uh, of course, as we all know, to impose a sentence. Um, the phrase used is that the offender shouldn't be more severely dealt with. So severe is still there. It's a slightly different phraseology. And in the court's view, they, they were analogous. Um, and the court referred to the case of R and KPR, which you see in the middle of the slide there. Similar considerations apply in respect of both provisions. The court reviewed uh, a number of authorities in coming to their conclusion in AB. And uh, I don't go through all the authorities, but they having gone through them, the court uh, set out the following principles or the following steps that any judge upon a retrial um, should go through, taking into account the jurisprudence in this area. And so I've set these out here. Firstly, what the judge should do is consider the appropriate total sentence for the offence or offences of which the defendant had been convicted at his retrial. So normal sentencing exercise, have a look at what you'd like to give him, um, considering uh, his conviction on this matter now. And this provisional sentence is to be determined in the usual way following any relevant guideline and without any regard to the original sentence. But then step two, the total provisional sentence and the corresponding total sentence for the same offences at the first trial should be compared. Thirdly, if the defendant had pleaded guilty at one of his trials, but not at the other, it will be necessary when making the relevant comparison to take into account any reduction made for the guilty plea. And so the court is making clear it's not a simple question where you look at one figure and you look at the other. You've got to take all these matters into account. And of course, any reduction for a guilty plea would be a relevant matter. Now, uh, it also was relevant to consider the effect of the principle of totality as it applied in the original sentence. It had to be considered. So the judge at retrial should, wherever possible, have regard to the sentencing remarks of the judge who imposed the original sentence. 
Um, totality is obviously important. There's a guideline on totality judges have to take into account. They don't always, which is why uh, appeals are mounted and often in respect just on that ground of totality, but often they do, particularly in sex offences and particularly in cases where there are a number of uh, sexual offences and particularly where there are more, where there is more than one complainant. And so if you have a retrial with one of the complainants has fallen away, as happened in AB, you have to, the court says, take into account what would the judge have imposed or try and work out how much of a reduction, if any, was made for the principle of totality? Uh, point five, if the provisional sentence is of a different kind from that imposed at the original trial uh, or attracts different release provisions, and this is important, a careful assessment will be needed before deciding whether the provisional sentence is more severe than the original sentence for the corresponding offences. So the overall impact of the provisional sentence must be considered. Now, at first sight, um, those of us who are used to the court of the bill saying, no, go away, it doesn't matter that he's now serving two thirds, whereas he would have been serving half before, um, the ears prick up. But the court um, said, it, release uh, and entitlement to release and license does matter here when you're looking at greater severity. This must involve considering any entitlement to automatic release, parole eligibility and license. And the court there applied R and Thompson. And you have the case reference there, albeit that uh, case concerned section 11.3. Uh, of the Criminal Appeal Act at um, Schedule 2, Power 2, rather than uh, Schedule 2, Power 2. So um, that's important as well. Bear in mind what are the different provisions, uh, release, etc., that apply. Point six was that the judge should assess the punitive effect of non-custodial orders, such as disqualification for driving sexual offence prevention orders, which weren't imposed after the original trial, but which it is necessary or appropriate to impose after the retrial. If the result of this comparison at point seven is that the provisional total sentence is more severe than the corresponding original total sentence, it must be reduced accordingly. Um, the Court of Appeal agreed with the obiter remarks of Simon Jane Skeynes that the words of the schedule do not preclude a longer sentence. They instead prohibit a sentence of greater severity. Uh, and that's why all of these points have to be gone through. So it, it, it's um, clear whether it is, in fact, a, a sentence of greater severity. Now, a point of interest is that the second ground, which actually was abandoned uh, at the appeal, but the second ground originally argued that the sentence was unlawful because the applicant would be required to serve two thirds of that sentence rather than one half. Uh, pursuant to Article 3 of the Release of Prisoners, alteration of relevant proportion of sentence. So we're saying that's another unfairness, um, taking into account, in fact, what the court eventually said should be taken into account. Just one point there. In the judgment, they refer to, to the order, which I've already referred to earlier, um, as uh, number 168 of 2020. That's wrong. It's number 158. The ground was abandoned on particular um, facts of the case because it was accepted that the provisions of the 2020 order, and this is why I've mentioned it here, uh, it's important to, to uh, acknowledge that the 2020 order and the sections of the 2003 Act to which it refers apply to individual sentences for individual offences. So the seven years refers to individual sentences rather than the totality of the term imposed as per the explanatory note. Uh, to the 2020 order. Any sentence served consecutively, which is not imposed for a term of seven years or more and for a relevant violent or sexual offence, will retain the halfway release point. That's obviously important because um, just an aside coming out of A and B for a second, when you're, if you have an offender who's being sentenced for a number of offences, rather than the judge, as they sometimes do, imposing one big sentence on a lead offence, it may be worth making the point that it's better constructed as consecutive sentence under the seven years. It might not find favour, but it would make a difference um, to the term served. Uh, and what I say just at the end uh, there, the, the, the last um, of paragraph 44 of the judgment is less than clear, but what it seems to be saying is Article 5 of, of the early uh, release statutory instrument provides that the increase of the custodial term doesn't apply to sentences imposed before 1st of December 2020. And a retrial sentence after that date would attract the increased custodial term 
uh, if it was for seven years or more, irrespective of the fact um, that it, it's deemed to be you start serving it um, after the, the original uh, trial. So um, it, it's worth having a look at that judgment. It, it's um, probably not earth shattering, but it is a, a, an interesting um, analysis of the jurisprudence in this area. Now, um, David's going to shout at me if I talk for much longer. So I'm going to move on um, to the case of Reed, uh, which is quite different. Uh, and again, this might take a little bit of time, but I promise to speed up with my other ones, David. So the case of Reed, again, an important decision, a case giving guidance, because um, it's six cases listed together. Uh, you'll see the judgment 21st of April, so it's still fairly recent. But six cases were listed together as they raised a question about the correct approach to be taken when sentencing offences against children under the Sexual Offences Act 2003, where no sexual activity had taken place. Now, there are various circumstances in, in the cases that were before the court where, where that was the case, because either the child uh, is a fiction or the defendant failed to persuade the child to engage the sexual uh, engage in the sexual activity, or the defendant was thwarted. Now that the first category, the child is a fiction, is where is basically the paedophile hunter cases, if I can call them that. But also, of course, undercover police cases, and and both um, sets uh, figured uh, in this appeal. You'll notice from the head note that two of the cases were appeals. Um, by the defendants or by the appellants, but the other four were actually Attorney General references, uh, and it will become clear why that was. Um, what the court sought to do in Reed is resolve uh, the tension between Privet and others um, from 2020 and Manning uh, from 2020. Um, and it's interesting that the decision in Manning was given a, a day after Privet, um, which perhaps explains why um, they were. Uh, a little, you'll see, not very uh, inconsistent. But what had happened is um, some judges were following Privet uh, and some judges were following Manning. Now, it had been suggested at appeal that the court in Manning adopted an approach that was potentially inconsistent with the guidance given in Privet. And the Court of Appeal reviewed the jurisprudence. They started with Baker, which is Leveson's um, decision. Um, that concerned a Section 10 offence, inciting a real child to engage in sexual activity. And it's important, it becomes important when you look at the judgment, that Privet and the cases that follow Privet concern Section 14, um, whereas this case, Baker, concerns Section 10 offences, inciting a child to engage in sexual activity. And you'll remember that um, Leveson held there that because the offending uh, didn't proceed beyond incitement, it was other sexual activity. It couldn't be the sexual activity, even if the, what was intended would ordinarily fall within category one or two if it had been acted upon. Because it wasn't acted upon, um, it had to fall into other sexual activity, which was category three, uh, the lowest category. And that was followed in the case of Cook. And you see the reference there. However, Privet, which concerns section 14, uh, offences of arranging or facilitating the commission of a child sexual offence uh, made a different decision. There, there were four appeals and uh, it, in all four cases, the defendant had been in contact with an undercover police officer posing as the mother of a fictitious child and all four defendants believed that the child was real uh, and arranged to meet to engage in sexual activity with the child. So the offences were contrary to section, uh, would have been contrary to section nine. In fact, because they didn't happen, uh, the defendants were charged with the section 14 offences of arranging or facilitating. Now, the guidance given in Privet was that when sentencing in respect of an offence contrary to section 14, where there was no real child, the judge should identify the category of harm on the basis of the category of harm that D intended, but to ameliorate that, uh, adjust the sentence in order to ensure it was commensurate with or proportionate to the applicable starting point and range if no sexual activity had taken place. The reason for that, the reason for the difference between Privet and Baker, the Court of Appeal said in Privet, was because it was important to bear in mind the terms of Section 14. It was a preparatory offence, that was the whole point of it, and it was complete when the arrangements for the offence were made or the intended offence had been facilitated. It wasn't dependent on the completed offence happening or even being possible. 
And in those circumstances, the absence of an actual victim didn't therefore reduce culpability. But because it concerned Section 14 offences and Baker concerned Section 910, there was no need for the court in Privet to decide if Baker had been correctly decided. Along comes Manning, which was, uh, as, was uh, as with Baker, was a Section uh, 10 and Section 9, causing or inciting a real child to engage in sexual activity and engaging in sexual activity with a child. The court uh, in Reed complained that the court in Manning hadn't been taken to Privet. I think they'd forgotten that they'd earlier mentioned that Privet had only been decided the day before. So it would have been particularly astute to be able to refer um, to the case of Privet. And the court in Manning followed Baker. Then there's the case of Russell, um, which was attempting to engage in sexual communication with a child, Section 15A, and attempting to cause or incite a girl to engage in sexual activity. That also followed Baker and Manning. So you can see that where they're Section 14 cases, they follow what Privet said. Where they're Section 9, 10 cases, um, they were following uh, Baker uh, uh, and Manning. And on the other side of the line at the bottom of the slide, you have Woolner, um, where uh, Privet was applied and expressed considerable reservations uh, uh, about Russell. The offences in Woolner, again, uh, were attempting to arrange or facilitate the commission of a child sex offence. The substantive offence would be section 14. So in this case, in Reed, the Court of Appeal found that it was clearly established that Privet, um, it had been, there wasn't a tension because it was clearly established that Privet should be uh, followed for section 14 offences. Uh, and Baker and Cook had indicated that for the section 9 and 10 offences where no sexual activity had taken place, either because the child was fictional, so it never could have, or because D failed to persuade the child to engage, uh, the harm would be in category three. But the court wasn't happy about this uh, and therefore posed the question, should the reasoning in Privet apply more widely to offences other than section 14 where no sexual activity occurs? And I don't think um, I'll be keeping you on tenterhooks, you won't be surprised to learn that the answer was, yes, privet should apply more widely. Despite the fact that both Sir Brian Leveson, who uh, presided in Baker, and Tree CLJ, who presided in Cook, had both been chairs of the Sentencing Council, and therefore one would presume they would have some insight as to what they meant when they were compiling those guidelines, and therefore what category um, the offender should be in. Despite that, uh, whilst acknowledging that, in fact, in the judgment, um, the Court of Appeal in Reed considered that the decisions in both cases were made per incurium. And specifically, the court um, placed some emphasis on Section 63 of the Sentencing Act 2020, which was uh, formerly Section 1431 of the CJA 2003, saying it lay at the centre of the overarching issue of principle, um, and yet it hadn't been referred to in those cases that, that placed the, the harm in Category 3A. Where a court is considering the seriousness of any offence, it must consider the culpability. And then when you look at harm, it should be any harm which the offence caused, was intended to cause, or might foreseeably have caused. The court went on to say the difference in approach between Privet and Baker, which depends on the particular offence with which the accused had been charged, was unsustainable. And from now on, the Privet approach should apply to all of the offences set out in their judgment in, in um, paragraph five, basically pretty much all uh, sexual offences uh, against children. When D attempted to commit the offences or incited a child to engage in certain activity, but the activity doesn't take place. And so therefore this habit of placing the conduct in a category 3A, if it hadn't taken place, had to stop. The harm should always be assessed in the first instance by reference to the defendant's intentions, followed by a downward movement from the starting point to reflect the fact that the sexual act didn't occur either because there was no real child or for any other reason. But of course, the extent of the downward adjustment would depend on the facts of the case, where an offender was only prevented from carrying out the offence at a late stage, or in circumstances where the child didn't exist, otherwise the offender would have carried it out, uh, there should only be a small reduction within the category range. But when an offender voluntarily desisted at an early stage, and particularly if the offending had been short-lived, a larger reduction is likely to be appropriate, potentially going outside um, the category range. Oh, forgive me. 
the difficulty, if I may, and I'll, I'll uh, turn to you, David, in a minute. The, the difficulty with this, um, as it seems to me, is it it elides culpability and harm because the guidelines, the sexual offences guidelines, are very clear. Culpability is one matter; harm is another. And where the harm is actually not caused, you are effectively punishing the offender for the harm that might have been caused, which actually goes more to their culpability than to harm itself if the harm wasn't actually caused. But um, there we are. I'll hand over to you, David. Thank you so much for that. Uh, well, I'll move on to distress directions. So the next case is a really good example of the need to have a checklist of potentially essential directions with you throughout the course of the trial and to take your time when thinking about what to discuss with the learned judge at that particular time before speeches. Now, I do a lot of work, as I know Farad does, um, advising convicted defendants on whether they have out of time appeals, particularly when they've received the negative advice from trial counsel. It never ceases to amaze me how often essential directions are missed out. Well, it doesn't always mean that there will be a meritorious appeal, but it did in the 2019 case of RVJS. Now, it's a little bit outside the last 12 months, but there were reporting restrictions in place, which means it wasn't a case that could be talked about until quite recently. Now, this was a case where a 79 year old was convicted of sexual offences against his daughter that took place 40 years earlier. Before I was sent the full papers, but told I was going to be instructed to have a look at it, I did what I normally do. I googled the case, see what I could find out about it out of interest. And the resident judge at Stoke was quoted in his sentencing remarks saying the following. During her oral evidence, it became very obvious just how damaged she is. I have seldom seen anyone more upset. She remains in a state of emotional turmoil. Wow, I thought. The judge has specifically concluded that her distress was some evidence of his guilt. I hope he directed the jury that distress was not a reliable indicator of truthfulness. He did not. A transcript was obtained of her evidence. And when she was accused of not telling the truth, which happened on a number of occasions, she became very upset indeed. And there were a number of breaks quite properly for her to compose herself. A transcript was also obtained of the discussion on the law between counsel and the trial judge. Defence counsel, prosecution counsel, no one raised distress directions at all. So no distress direction was given. Well, I appealed on behalf of JS many, many months out of time and the single judge granted leave on the papers and the Court of Appeal quashed the convictions. They referred to the directions in the Crown Court compendium and particularly the direction on distress as witnessed by the jury when a witness is giving evidence. And they said such a direction should have been given. And it's an important quote on the subject. So I've put it in full and I'll read through it. The guidance, that is the compendium, is directed to the truthfulness of the complainant, which is particularly apposite in a case such as this, when, as the judge directed the jury, it was one person's word against another. As a result of the failure to give any such direction, the jury received no guidance as to the evidential value of X's distress. They were given no warning as to the unreliability of her distress as being a pointer to the truthfulness or untruthfulness of what she was saying. In our judgment, in the circumstances of this case, the failure to give such a direction represents a serious irregularity. And the point is clear. It's easy for a person who's not involved in the criminal courts to see a witness crying and being terribly upset and to assume that that's because they're telling the truth. And it's an important direction to prevent the jury from making that jump. And it was missing in this case. In fact, it went further in the case of JS because there was complaint evidence in the usual way from a friend who gave evidence that at the time 
um, that the complainant told her about what had happened, the complainant was extremely upset. There was no direction about that either. And there should have been, because there's a direction and a compendium for distress at the time of the complaint too. The court said in our judgment, what was required was a direction to the effect that the distress shown by X at the time of her later complaint was a part of her complaint, which should be assessed together with the complaint and not be given any separate weight. We regard this failure as representing a material irregularity and they quash the convictions. So tip of the day, make sure you've got the Crown Court compendium on your laptop or tablet. It's got all the directions there. It's available on the judiciary website. The judges have it and it's absolutely invaluable. David, just before you move on from there, there's something yeah. in the chat saying that the reference may not be correct. So if you have another reference, that might be quite useful to give. OK. Uh, all right. Well, I'll check that. Thank you. Thank you very much for whoever that was. Um, the next case I want to talk about um, is, a, is an unusual case, deception and consent. And it's the case of R.V. Jason Lawrence. Person A lies to person B. As a result of that lie, person B agrees to have sex with person A. Person B would never have agreed to have had sex if she had known that it was a lie. Question, in law, is that rape? Answer, it depends. Lawrence was my case at trial. It was a rare prosecution in that it involved an allegation of rape on the basis of a deception negating ostensible consent. It was a unique case on the basis that the deception was about whether he was fertile. He had lied about having had a vasectomy in circumstances where the complainant X would not have had unprotected sex with him otherwise. She would have had sex with him, but she would have insisted on a condom. It follows, therefore, that she was tricked into having unprotected sex because of her reliance on his lie. Now, they had chatted online for some time, but they only met and only ever met for one night, the night when the sexual intercourse took place. They were effectively strangers to one another. Well, I made an application to dismiss and then a submission of no case, which both failed, the trial judge ruling that the deception was capable in law of vitiating consent. The jury convicted and the Court of Appeal allowed the appeal, the Lord Chief Justice presiding. And when I, before I look at the arguments involved, let me just make something very clear. No one in this case was suggesting that on the facts accepted by the jury, the actions of Lawrence were not anything other than morally reprehensible. The issue was, did they amount to rape? So what were the arguments and what was the court's reasoning? Well, it all begins really with the statutory definition of consent, which is in front of you. Section 74 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003, a person consents if he agrees by choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. Well, the argument on appeal was simple. While X would not have had unprotected sex if she had known the truth, she still had the freedom and the capacity to choose whether to have unprotected sex or not. She had agreed or chosen to have intercourse, and she had agreed and chosen to allow ejaculation. So could it be said that the lie had robbed her of her freedom and capacity to choose whether a condom should be used? Was it right that every time a lie was told, that caused the person to have sex in circumstances where they would not have done, that a sexual offence was committed? If not, which lies made the sex criminal and which did not, or did all of them? I'm not married. I'm the same religion as you. I don't eat meat either and never would. I love you. When should the criminal law intervene? To give another example of a lie relevant to the issue in this case about the risk of pregnancy. If a woman lied to a man and told him she was on the pill when she wasn't, and this caused him to have unprotected sex 
in circumstances where he would have insisted on wearing a condom if it wasn't for the lie, should she be prosecuted as a sex offender? Well, ultimately, the Court of Appeal concluded that some lies were capable of vitiating ostensible consent, but only lies that were closely connected to the performance of the sexual act. And the court relied heavily on the decision of the admin court in Monaco v. the DPP, where in that case, it had upheld the CPS's decision not to prosecute for rape undercover officers who had sex with women who believed their lies, that they were like-minded protesters and not police officers, a case that's had much public attention. They also said that given the Court of Appeal had previously ruled that a lie as to being infected with HIV was not rape because the sexual act had still been agreed to, just not the infection with a virus, and that's the case of RVB, that the, they concluded that the same principle should apply in Lawrence's case. They concluded that the deception as to fertility was a lie about the possible consequences of the sexual act not about the actual sexual act itself, and therefore it could not properly be described as closely connected to the performance of the sexual act. They recognised that to uphold the trial judge's ruling would be on one view to widen the meaning and understanding of consent. It would risk criminalising some people not previously considered by some to be sexual offenders. And it held that in all the circumstances, it was not for the Court of Appeal to widen the definition of consent. And then there's this quote. We recognise the acute difficulties in dealing with the circumstances where someone had been tricked into consenting to sexual contact as a result of misrepresentations. We echo, and they made reference to other judges, that these issues require debate as a matter of social and public policy. Interestingly, the prosecution did not seek leave to appeal to the Supreme Court on the basis it was a point of general public importance. Uh, that's the case of Lawrence. Back to you, Marat. Thank you. So, just share my screen once more. So, hopefully you can all see the slide that uh, refers to the case of Gould. Bear with me one second. Uh, again, significant uh, guidance case, March of this year, and you'll probably all have seen at least some reference to this. Um, and it concerned um, the use by Crown Court judges of um, their Section 66 powers as set out in the Courts Act 2003. And this is where Crown Court judges have power to exercise the powers of a district judge magistrate's court. Um, they pulled together four cases where the judge had sat as a district judge magistrate's court. And as the Court of Appeal put it, in order to correct defects in the charges, it's right to say that the Court of Appeal here were quite cross with um, the prosecution, saying that what the Crown Court judges had sought to do uh, in these cases was rectify what they saw were, rather prob were either problems with, with the charges or something that had gone wrong uh, in the court below. But in fact, in most of the cases had ended up uh, making things uh, a little worse, uh, not through uh, any fault of their own, really. The court um, held that Section 66 empowered the judicial office holders named in it. And there's a very long list. It used to be a much shorter list, but as the court pointed out, it's now a fairly lengthy list to sit as a magistrate's court, exercising the power to do so vested uh, in a district judge in the magistrate's court. Um, but the powers were limited to those that could be exercised uh, relating to criminal causes or matters. Um, but the, the district judge's power to sit as a magistrate's court hadn't been excluded from the jurisdiction given under Section 66. And therefore, the power was um, to sit and act as a magistrate's court. So it would be a Crown Court sitting uh, in that capacity. However, um, if those who were exercising Section 66 powers didn't properly apply the rules which district judges were obliged to follow. An appeal court would consider whether the procedural flaws required the quashing of the orders made or whether they could be overlooked. And I'll come back to that uh, in a couple of slides time. 
Um, the court made clear that Crown Court judges and staff often had little experience of magistrates' court procedure. And if the prosecution in a particular case in the Crown Court asked a judge to sit as a district judge, it had to provide procedural assistance. And you'll see from the judgment that what had happened in many of the cases is both the prosecution and often the defence would say, no, it's fine, you can do that, but then didn't really give the judge any assistance as to what would have happened in the court below, what would magistrates' court actually do in those circumstances. Court of Appeal said if a judge was unsure of his or her powers, the safe course would sometimes be to decline to deal with the matter and the prosecution would just have to take its case back to the magistrate's court. Section 66 should only be used where it was clear that the case should be dealt with by the Crown Court or where the exercise was intended to tie up loose ends and avoid unnecessary hearings, which was partly the point of the Section 66 powers. A defendant who would wish to be sentenced in the lower court shouldn't be deprived of that possibility by procedural failures. And there's two important parameters within which the Section 66 powers should be used, which the Court of Appeal emphasised. When the Magistrates Court makes an order giving jurisdiction to the Crown Court, whether that's by committal for sentence or sending for trial, that's the end of their jurisdiction in the case. They are functus officio. The Crown Court judge cannot use Section 66 to make any order which the Magistrates Court could no longer make. So there were specific instances in the actual cases that were before the court in Gould where the Crown Court judge didn't approve of or didn't quite think the Magistrates Court uh, had done the right thing or the CPS hadn't done the right thing. And so they sought to do it again themselves sitting as a Magistrates Court. But the court were clear no, if the magistrate's court can do it, then you can do it. But if they can no longer do it, for example, because the matter has been sent to you, that's it, game over. The second parameter is there is no power in the Crown Court to quash an irregular order. If quashing is required, it can only be done by a divisional court. And where an order is plainly bad on its face, the Crown Court can hold that nothing's happened. Um, nothing has occurred which is capable of conferring any jurisdiction to deal with it. But where it goes further and thinks that they've actually, the Magistrates Court uh, has actually done something wrong or there's an irregular order, then they don't have any power. It's got to go off to the divisional court. And again, that was based on some uh, one of the specific cases that had happened uh, in the cases before it. Just because a judge can sit uh, as a Magistrates Court uh, district judge, it, uh, it doesn't mean that the differences between the Crown Court and the Magistrate Court has been abolished. Uh, and this is where the, the court emphasised that the powers of the Magistrates Court are circumscribed by a statutory scheme. They don't have inherent powers, they're a creature of statute, and the statutory scheme is complex, prescriptive and restrictive, and it's important for Crown Court judges to remember that and apply the rules properly. And what would happen if they didn't apply the rules properly? Well, if those exercising Section 66 powers don't properly apply the rules, which the district judge would be obliged to follow, then the Court of Appeal or the Divisional Court will look at the actual decision uh, and apply the analysis as was set out in Ashton, Draz and O'Reilly from 2006 to determine whether the procedural flaw was so bad that they go to the root of the exercise of the Section 66 power requiring the quashing of the orders, something that they can't do, or whether they can be overlooked or remedied if this causes uh, no prejudice. So um, it, it's got to be the Court of Appeal or the Divisional Court will look at what's happened uh, uh, and decide whether they need to quash it or whether it can be overlooked because it's not really a problem. Some practical matters, a judge using Section 66 powers had to explain exactly what powers were being exercised and why. The judge had to be explicit about which sentences were imposed as a district judge and which as a Crown Court judge. This had to be clear in the order and in the magistrate's court records. Um, where a judge sitting in the Crown Court exercises the powers of a district judge to make an order which the magistrate's courts could have made or made a new order, this should be reflected in the records of the lower court. The court realised when they were asking questions of the, the different parties in front of them that there was no uniform policy of a, dis, of a Crown Court judge telling the magistrate's court what had happened when effectively exercising a magistrate's court jurisdiction. The Crown Court must therefore record what has happened and inform the magistrate's court. The Court uh, of Appeal invited the Criminal Procedure Rules Committee to consider the issue of the recording of the exercise by a Crown Court judge of powers of the district judge and whether there should be a uniform procedure for informing the Magistrates Court that its order had been varied. <laughs>
Now, some specific um, instances that the court looked at, caution committals and remitting cases. The Crown Court lacked power to quash a committal by the Magistrates Court or to remit a case to the Magistrates Court, um, the case of R and Sheffield, uh, ex parte DPP. If there was a bad committal, the Crown Court had no power to do anything because the origin of its jurisdiction was a committal which was valid on its face. If there was no committal at all, the case had never left the Magistrates' Court and it would usually be for the prosecution to go back to the Magistrates' Court uh, and sort it out there. It was open to a judge acting under Section 66 to deal with the matter from scratch because the Magistrates' Court was not functus officio, but that wasn't always appropriate. Uh, And if it did happen, the Magistrates' Court had to be uh, informed indications of plea and the court was particularly exercised by section 17a of the magistrates court to act because of course there's a process there are certain things that must be said to the defendant there are certain things he must be asked uh, and he's allowed uh, to 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 choose to to make an exercise and if that wasn't done by the crown court judge then that wasn't right Um, and the court made it clear that if the Crown Court didn't follow the mandatory procedure set out in Section 17A of the Mags Court Act for taking an indication of plea, what followed was a nullity and it was liable to be quashed. Uh, uh, and the case of Ram uh, Desfouli and Woodgreen Crown Court um, supports that. There was a question as to whether that rule applied where the Crown Court judge exercised a district judge's jurisdiction to correct a defect in a committal for sentence and where the Section 17A procedure had been followed in the lower court. But again, uh, a- applying uh, the principle that unless it went to the root of it, um, it the-, the likely answer was as long as there had been a Section 17A procedure below, it, it wasn't a problem. And vacating pleas. The court had the power to vacate a guilty plea even when the defendant didn't seek that course or oppose it but it had to be something exercised sparingly and when the interest of justice required. And it was unlikely to be appropriately used to rescue the prosecution from its own muddle. And this referred to a specific incident before the Court of Appeal where where that's exactly what had happened. Because the Crown Court judge wasn't pleased um, with the charges that had come to the Crown Court, even though the defendant had pleaded guilty to them in the Magistrates Court, the pleas were vacated despite that not being something that the defence wanted. Uh, And so I think that that final sentence there is very useful. It's unlikely to be appropriately used to rescue the prosecution um, from its own muddle. Uh, And the final slide in respect uh, of Gould. In one of the cases, there there was a typo in the date of the offence and the Crown Court judge sat as a district judge to correct the date. You might think that's a bit excessive, but it was because uh, it uh, it was a, a theft or a fraud uh, and the date range, if it had been properly properly set, was about three years. But because it was wrong, it was three months. But the court said, um, the Court of Appeal said this was unnecessary. You could have just ignored it. Everybody actually knew what he'd been committed on. Everyone knew it was said to be over three years. The fact that the indictment uh, got it wrong didn't matter. The procedure, and because it didn't matter, it wasn't a nullity. There'd been a valid committal the judge's actions could be ignored and the sentence was lawfully passed. Gould is is salutary because in one of them, it it was a series of uh, quite serious sexual offences. And the reason it got to the Court of Appeal was they were appealing against sentence. But the upshot was because of what the Crown Court judge had done, um, it was all for nothing. It was all a nullity. And the whole thing had to go back Um, to the Magistrates Court to start again. And so that's why the court in Gould were particularly exercised, because it can have far-reaching repercussions. Um, So the whole thing, as I say, had to start again. Now, the final um, case I want to talk about is, in fact, not one case, just as a nice surprise for you in case we're wearing you down after an hour of speaking. Um, It's just a a, a quick trot through a number of cases um, which are important, and then I'll hand back to David uh, to finish up. The first one is AG's Ref. It, it's from December of last year, uh, and it may be that you're familiar with it, but it's it's important because it's to do with sexual assault and intention. And in this case, um, at trial, the defendant had argued it was necessary for the prosecution to prove that he had intended his touching to be sexual. So what had happened is he's on a train, apparently he's drunk, um, a young woman gets on the train and um, he almost sits in her lap and then kisses her on the mouth. Uh, And the defence he was running at trial was it wasn't sexual, he was just giving her a peck. 
Um, and so he said to the trial judge that uh, it was argued that the judge had to direct the jury as to his intention, that he has intent. Now, those of us who are familiar with Heard and the other cases on this would be quite taken aback by this because it had been clearly established um, that that wasn't the case. So the um, judge duly directed the jury and the jury acquitted because they couldn't be sure of his intention. And so this is one of those fairly rare attorney general's reference where it's actually a question of law to do um, with the offence. It's a conviction reference. And the question for the Court of Appeal was, was it necessary for the prosecution to prove as an element of the offence of sexual assault, not only that he intentionally touched another person without their consent, uh, and that that touching um, was indecent, but or sexual, um, without reasonable belief in their consent and the touching was sexual, but that the offender had intended his touching that person to be sexual. And the answer, it won't surprise you to learn, was no, you don't give a direction uh, about intention. Section three already expressly set out the required state of mind. Under section 78, the motive or purpose of D only became relevant when his actions were not necessarily indecent. Uh, and the court was quite exercised by the fact that the supplement to Rook and Ward and the main work weren't consistent. The Court of Appeal disagreed with the supplement, which stated that the defendant must intend the touching to be sexual, whereas the main work um, set out quite clearly that there was no such direction necessary, that there, there isn't uh, a need to say that the defendant must intend the touching to be sexual. Now, my final slide, you'll all be pleased to learn, it is just uh, three cases that I want to romp through. Um, Butters being mainly because it's mine and I want to show off because David has, and, you know. Um, but it was a recent um, win for uh, imprisonment for public protection, uh, overturned 15 years after it was imposed. Um, which is quite shocking, really, because um, she had been in prison for most, if not all, of those 15 years, uh, imposed very early in 2005, and the Court of Appeal said never should have been. She wasn't dangerous. So it's a very sad case, but it does show that it, even in these times, there are still people out there who are in prison on, on such sentences, and they really shouldn't be. Um, case of Crampton, uh, it's Facebook evidence. This is going to keep happening. It's going to keep coming to the Court of Appeal and they're going to keep saying that it's all right, um, that it's not a breach of the codes or the judge exercise their discretion. But it is very troubling because the protections that are there uh, around identification parades, the codes simply aren't there. The protections aren't there around Facebook identifications. In this particular case, the Court of Appeal found that the judge performed a balancing exercise, although there'd been a breach of the code in that there hadn't been a viper, it didn't necessarily mean the Facebook ID should be excluded. It was a matter for the judge. And again, just mentioning one of my own cases, and I see Piers is on the chat. He instructed me on that. The case of Connor Phillips, uh, where we resoundingly lost, arguing a very similar point. Even worse, because as well as Facebook uh, ID, there was hearsay evidence uh, where the defendant was named by people unknown. And then finally, the case of Gabbana. Um, Joel and I did this case where we got a fairly robust kicking, if I can put it like that. But what we did do is manage to establish that uh, the standard of proof for the purposes of evidence admitted under any gateway in Section 101, where a disputed issue as to bad character arises for the jury to determine, is the same for all gateways. And that standard, as Mitchell confirms, albeit that was in the context of a propensity direction, is the criminal standard. Um, so uh, a silver lining there. And I will hand over now to David. Thank you, Farrat. Well, two to go. They uh, are, well, the first one is extremely important for all practitioners to know about. So uh, that's to look forward to. And the final one, just to keep you all tuned into the very end, is extraordinary. So PLACU, reduction for guilty plea. Now this case was a conjoined appeal of four appellants three of whom from two separate cases who had all pleaded guilty to indictable only offences at the first opportunity. Oh, I forgot to press the uh, icon. That first opportunity being their PTPH in the Crown Court. All three only received 25% credit. They all appealed on the basis that they should have had the maximum credit, 33%. A fourth defendant, Smith, in a separate case, heard at the same time, 
also pleaded guilty at the first opportunity in the Crown Court at his PTPH. He did receive a 33% discount and the Solicitor General appealed that sentence on the basis it was unduly lenient for a number of reasons, it's fair to say, including that he should have only had 25%. What is going on, I hear you say? Pleads guilty at the first opportunity, doesn't get full credit? Well, that can't be right. Thank goodness the Court of Appeal exists. They'll do the right thing, surely. But then you would have overlooked, if you thought any of that, Section 73 of the Sentencing Code. Well, it's set out for you there. But uh, what you probably forgot was that this requires a court to take into account the stage in the proceedings at which the offender had indicated the intention to plead guilty and the circumstances in which the indication was given. So it's not about when you plead guilty, it's about when you indicate that you're going to plead guilty. And that place, of course, is not at the PTPH. The earliest opportunity is in the magistrate's court, a place that uh, a far more eminent speaker on these sorts of matters than I, the secret barrister, described as the Wild West, where he, she, set a whole chapter aside to expose its litany of incompetence, ignorance and sheer pig-headedness. Yes, that's the place where it matters. So, despite the fact that you may not have had a person-to-person -person meeting with your lawyer because it was on video link, despite the fact that disclosure could be sparse to non-existent, and despite the fact that your head may still be spinning from being arrested and incarcerated for the first time in your life only a few hours earlier, if you don't indicate a guilty plea there, there and then, to a serious crime that you've just been accused of, you ain't getting full credit. And if you do plead guilty at your first Crown Court hearing, when you've seen your lawyer, seen some papers, been properly advised, well, you still aren't getting full credit because you could have indicated it earlier. The first three defendants all had their appeals refused. Now, it may be you're sitting there thinking, well, on a literal interpretation of the code, that's a very proper decision. And far be it from me to criticise the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Holroyd presiding. But doesn't it completely ignore the realities of life and what it's like for a defendant at a first appearance in the Magistrates' Court? What happened to the fourth defendant, you ask? Smith. Well, even though he had indicated in the Magistrates' Court that it was likely he would plead guilty, the court held that this was not an unequivocal indication and so the recorder had fallen into a clear error of principle in awarding 33%. Um, although they sought to vindicate the recorder's failure, so good news for any recorders out there, by making the point very clearly that he had been led into error by counsel. So no, it was counsel's fault, not the judges. Now, interestingly, they did not consider the bonus 8% that he had accrued, either alone or in combination with other arguments, sufficient to, to deem the sentence unduly lenient. So there was a happy ending for one person in that case, at least, but it's an important case to bear in mind. Finally, I promised you something extraordinary, and that is the case of Sakin. A sorry tale of woe. Uh, two aspects to this case. Firstly, advocates should pay attention. And secondly, appeals can be reopened. Now, all of us doing this job can and do make mistakes, of course. Some are necessarily going to be more significant than others. But the facts of this case should serve as a warning, if one is needed, not to take your eye off the ball. And perhaps most importantly, always listen to the summing up. Don't start preparing your next case quite so soon. The facts. Two defendants charged and convicted with serious sexual offences regarding the forced and controlled prostitution of a vulnerable woman. In the consideration of a possible appeal against conviction, a transcript of the summing up was obtained in the usual way. After summarising the first defendant's evidence, the, def the, the transcript recorded that the learned judge had said, and that concludes my review of the evidence. <laughs> 
nothing about the second defendant's defence. As the Court of Appeal described it, there had been a wholesale failure to refer to Sackin's defence or his evidence. Now, although trial counsel had not raised it at the time, grounds of appeal were drafted on the basis of the judge's failure to sum up his defence evidence and case. The co-defendant appealed on separate grounds. At the appeal hearing, both defence counsel and prosecution counsel, so three of them, all there during the trial, confirmed to the court that the transcript was accurate. And on that basis, that is, that the trial judge had failed to sum up Sackin's evidence, the court allowed Sackin's appeal and directed a retrial. A week later, as chance would have it, Sackin's counsel appeared in front of the trial judge in a wholly unrelated matter. The judge inquired informally as to what had happened at the appeal. Oh, well, his conviction was crushed as a result of your failure to sum up his case, Your Honor. The judge, I expect, for this isn't in the transcript, looked puzzled, went away and listened to the darts recording, for she was sure she had. And having listened to the darts recording, she listened to herself speaking for 20 minutes in summary of the second defendant's evidence. The transcript provided for the appeal was incomplete. Human error by the transcribers. The Court of Appeal was immediately informed, and obviously fair enough, counsel as well, also listened to the darts and immediately informed the court quite properly. And a full transcript was obtained quick smart. And less than two weeks later, the court reconvened. Now, before we get to what happened, although you can probably guess, the court has an inherent power to reconsider its decisions before the decision has been sealed by the registrar, did you even know that, and recorded by the Crown Court. If the Crown Court has recorded it, there still does remain a strictly limited jurisdiction to reopen an appeal if a defect has led to some real injustice or there's a nullity. That's the case of Yasse, followed by the case of Gohill. The Court of Appeal were not happy. Three counsel at trial all appeared before them and confirmed something that was patently wrong. The court revoked the previous order quashing his conviction and dismissed his appeal. So what lessons can we learn from this sorry tale of woe? And what was it the Court of Appeal pointed out? Well, firstly, and who, who'd have believed it, don't always trust the transcript. They can be wrong and they can be incomplete. It's probably better to pay attention and maybe even take a note, particularly at the point at which the judge comes to your client's case. It is a core duty of trial advocates, both for the prosecution and defence, to focus on the judicial summing up at the time that it is given. This is necessary for the proper discharge of the advocate's overriding duty to the court in the due administration of justice. And this is perhaps the most important thing. In particular, it is the advocate's duty to raise promptly with the judge what appears to be a material error in the summing up, whether it be of law or fact at the time of the summing up. And that goes both ways, whether it helps your client or doesn't. You have a duty to the court and you're not in breach of your duty to the client if you correct an error that was in his favour. You have to. And it's particularly important for those most junior practitioners because we've all sat there and the summing up comes to an end and perhaps the learned judge doesn't say, does counsel wish to raise anything with me? just go straight to sending the jury out. And we've all been there. There is a level of fear that rises within you, particularly in those junior days, about wishing to stand up in front of the jury. You suddenly become full of self-doubt that maybe you've got it wrong, the judge got it right. Well, you mustn't have those fears. You have a duty to correct any errors. You have to stand up and deal with it. You have to err on the safe side. The Court of Appeal says so. What did they say about counsel? Make, well, this was kind. They recognised the, the, the state, the parlous state of the legal aid system for us all, making all due allowances for the sometimes difficult circumstances in which the publicly funded criminal bar has to operate. 
we regret to say that there simply can be no acceptable excuse for what has happened here. So don't let it happen to you. So there we go. That's what we think is important in the last year. I can see from the chat, we are not inundated with questions, but it's now seven o'clock. So unless someone wishes to pipe up really quickly, we'd like to thank you so much for spending the early part of your evening in our company. We hope uh, both of us that what we've said today is helpful. Uh, thank you very much too, Sophie. And uh, as you would have seen on the message board, the whole thing has been recorded. If you missed any of the references, they're all there. You can go to the Carla website. Hopefully it'll be up, if not tomorrow, by the end of the week. <laughs> and uh, we wish you all a pleasant evening. Is there anything you'd like to add, perhaps? No, thank you all for coming. Super. Well, Bye. we'll leave it there. Bye, everybody. <laughs>